In this lecture video, we will cover the muscular system. So muscles are a type of tissue that make up about half of your body's mass. What's unique about muscles is that they have the ability to convert chemical energy into mechanical energy. Let's review the three types of muscles. We talked about skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and smooth muscle tissue. First, let's take a look at skeletal muscles. This is the main type of muscle that we're gonna focus on in this video. What you'll notice about skeletal muscles is that they are going to be long. So we call each of these a skeletal muscle fiber. However, a skeletal muscle fiber is the same thing as a skeletal muscle cell. But because this cell is so long, we use the term fiber sometimes. Each of these skeletal muscle fibers is going to be multinucleated. It's gonna have the organelles that you find in most other cells. However, it also has some specialized organelles that we're gonna talk about. And something else you're gonna notice about skeletal muscle fibers is that they are striated. So you're gonna notice that there's gonna be these bands of dark lines and um, lighter colors, light lines, on skeletal muscle fibers. We will talk about what these striations are and what they're made of. We also talked about cardiac muscle. This is the type of muscle that you find only in the heart. It is unique because it has these structures here called intercalated discs. Most of the cells in the cardiac muscle are single nucleated. It is striated and this is gonna provide involuntary movement, of course. We will talk more about cardiac muscles in the cardiovascular system, in anatomy and physiology too, but I will not be talking so much about this tissue in this lecture video. Here is a smooth muscle. It's gonna have these muscle cells or muscle fibers that are, that are spindle shaped. They're gonna be uninucleated you won't find any striations on smooth muscle. Both cardiac and smooth muscle are involved with involuntary contractions or involuntary movement. Skeletal muscle, on the other hand, is involved with voluntary movement and, for the most part, voluntary action. Here are some of the characteristics of muscle tissues. They are excitable, so as you will see, um, we will talk about how skeletal muscle is able to generate something called action potentials, or in other words, these electrical impulses that travel down skeletal muscle cells. It has the ability to contract or become shorter, and it has the ability to extend and become longer and it is elastic, so it has a certain amount of flexibility. Here are some of the functions of muscles. They produce movement. That's the main function. They help with maintaining posture and body position. They help stabilize your joints. And as you know, um, you probably have heard that doing things such as weightlifting uh, and exercises Different types of exercises will help stabilize your joints. And the movement of muscles helps generate heat. When we talk about organs in everyday language, we think about the stomach, the heart, the intestines. But we don't usually think about each and every muscle in our body as a separate organ. However, each muscle in your body can be considered a discrete organ. It's an organ of its own. Same thing goes with bones. Every single bone in your body is an organ. And the reason for that is because each muscle in your body is made out of several types of tissue. It's made out of skeletal muscle fibers, of course, but there's other types of tissue that are involved with uh, the making of each muscle. Here is a diagram here of one muscle. 
So we need to know how this muscle here is organized. And as you will see, you'll, you'll notice that there are different types of tissue here that make up this muscle. So first, let's take a look over here. This is a bone, this is a muscle, and as you can see here, this connective tissue here, um, this is dense regular connective tissue, but this tissue is what is keeping this muscle connected to the bone. So this is a tendon. When you um, remove the skin and you look at the muscles of the body, what you'll notice is that there's going to be sort of this tissue that's going to cover all of your muscles. It's just kind of like a saran wrap covering the muscles. That's called fascia. So we could see like a little piece of it over here. And fascia is a connective tissue that connects muscles to each other. So all muscles in your body are kind of wrapped around by this tissue called the fascia. Now, if we remove the fascia, we'll notice that there are other connective tissues surrounding your muscles and even surrounding each and every um, cell in your muscles. So if we remove the fascia, underneath that, you're gonna find another connective tissue called the epimesium. The epimesium is a sheet of dense, irregular connective tissue that surrounds the whole muscle. So let's go back. Here was the tendon. Here is fascia. This is gonna be the connective tissue that connects one muscle to another. Now, if we remove the fascia, we're gonna find this connective tissue here called the epimesium. And the epimesium is gonna be this connective tissue that's going to surround this whole muscle. This one individual muscle is going to be surrounded by the epimesium. Okay, so we talked about the fascia, we talked about the epimesium. Now, if we look at a muscle, one muscle by itself and we cut it, we will notice that skeletal muscle fibers are organized into these units, in these units called fascicles. So each muscle is gonna be composed of these units ca called fascicles. And each fascicle is going to be covered with a connective tissue called perimesia. So let's take a look over here. Again, we had the tendon, the fascia, underneath the fascia, you're gonna have this whole muscle. The muscle is gonna be surrounded by a connective tissue called the epimesium. Now, if we cut the muscle, this whole entire muscle, you're gonna see these units over here. Here's like one fascicle over here, here's another fascicle over here. And if we pull out a fascicle, it looks like this. It's gonna be filled with skeletal muscle fibers. What you'll notice is that the fascicles are gonna be divided by this connective tissue here called perimesium. So perimesium is going to be the connective tissue that's going to surround each fascicle. Now each fascicle is gonna be made of many skeletal muscle fibers. Remember, Skeletal muscle fiber and cell are really the same thing. And what's interesting is that if we take out a fascicle and we look at the skeletal muscle cells, we'll notice that each and every cell is going to be surrounded by a connective tissue called endomesium. And I believe the endomesium is primarily made out of areolar connective tissue. So let's go back and take a look. Again, this was the whole muscle and it's surrounded by the epimesium. Usually in anatomy, you'll notice that the term epi is used for things that are um, on the outside. And then in each muscle, we're gonna find many fascicles. So here's a fascicle here, here's a fascicle here. If we take out this fascicle, we will notice that it's gonna be surrounded by a connective tissue called perimesium. 
And if we take a look at the fascicle, we will notice that there is skeletal muscle cells in each and every fascicle. So this is a skeletal muscle cell. This is a skeletal muscle cell. This is a skeletal muscle cell. And if we take out a skeletal muscle cell, so this is one cell over here, this cell or fiber is going to be surrounded by a connective tissue called endomysium. In anatomy, usually things that are um, lining the inner layers of an organ are called endo. So this is going to be the endomysium covering the skeletal muscle fiber or cell. Now, what's interesting is that if you take a look at a skeletal muscle fiber, there, it's going to have some unique structures. They're going to be, um, and they're going to look different from most other cells in your body. Each skeletal muscle is going to be long and cylinder shaped. It is multinucleated. The plasma membrane of skeletal muscle cell is called sarcolemma sarcolemma is just you know a unique name for the plasma membrane of the cell it has um, this cell has the organelles you find in other cells in your body such as the mitochondria um, the rough er the smooth er everything like that but then there's going to be some specialized organelles there so one of those specialized organelles is something called myofibril and myofibrils are rod-like structures that fill up these skeletal muscle fibers. Myofibrils are actually these structures that allow contraction of the muscle to happen. So you can think about them as these organelles that contract. They allow contraction to happen. So there's going to be many, many myofibrils filling each and every skeletal muscle cell. Another organelle you're going to find is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is a smooth ER, but it's a very specialized smooth ER that you only find in skeletal muscle fibers. So it is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. Another organelle you're going to find in skeletal muscle fibers are T tubules. And we're going to look at each and every one of these organelles. Again, myofibrils, I want you to understand a myofibril is not a cell on its own. We, we could think about it as an organelle. It's a rod-like structure that you're going to find inside each muscle cell. And each muscle cell is going to have hundreds to thousands of myofibrils. And these myofibrils are going to allow contraction to happen. About 80% of the cell volume of skeletal muscle cells is going to be made of myofibrils. So let's take a look at this diagram over here. So this right here is a skeletal muscle fiber, again, or cell, whatever you want to call it. It's a, it's a cell, but it's really long, so we call it a fiber. And you can see there's going to be organelles here. So here's mitochondria. You will see that um, a skeletal muscle fiber has many mitochondria. Um, here is the sarcolemma right here. So it's the plasma membrane of the cell. And inside of the cell, you're going to find these rod-like structures called myofibrils. It's going to be jam-packed these myofibrils and you'll find other organelles there like nuclei and we talk about we talked about how it is multinucleated so if we take a myofibril and we blow it up it looks something like this and it's really important for us to understand the structures on a myofibril so that we understand how muscle contraction works so we're going to talk about all of these structures so before we go um, deeper into how contraction of muscles happens, I want you to pause this video and see if you could label this diagram here. You should understand how a muscle is organized. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and label this diagram. Okay, so number one is just tendon. That's all it is, it's a tendon. The fascia is really removed on this diagram. So number two is the epimysium. Remember, this is connective tissue that's going to surround the entire muscle. And each and every muscle in your body is an organ. Um, let's go ahead and skip three for just a second. Number four. If we take a look at number four, we'll see, you know, there's two right here. Um, each one of these right here is a fascicle. So if you pull out a fascicle, it looks something like this. And surrounding each fascicle is going to be the perimysium. Now let's look at a fascicle here. This is a fascicle. Well, we could see inside the fascicle, there's going to be skeletal muscle cells or fibers. So number three, this is a skeletal muscle cell or fiber. And number five, as you can see, what's covering surrounding each skeletal muscle fiber is going to be the endomysium. There's two number fives, but they're really pointing to the same thing. Okay, so now we're going to move on and see how muscle contraction actually happens. And for us to understand that, we really need to understand how these myofibrils inside of the cell work. So if you take a look at this myofibril, it's going to be made up of chains of these units called sarcomeres. The sarcomere is the smallest contractile unit of skeletal muscle cells. So you're going to have chains of these sarcomeres. The way to identify them is to look for something called the Z-line or the Z-disc. So from one Z-line to another, you're going to have a sarcomere. So again, this was the cell. This is a skeletal muscle cell or fiber. We're going to take out one of these myofibrils here and blow it up, and it looks something like this. And these are some organelles that are surrounding it, but if we remove the organelles, we're just going to look at this. And what you'll notice here is that it's going to be made out of these proteins here. These are really proteins. We'll talk about them. Now, from this Z line to this Z line over here, you have something called a structure called a sarcomere. And this myofiber here is going to be made out of this long chain of sarcomeres. So this sarcomere here has the ability to contract. When we looked at skeletal muscle fibers, um, or the skeletal muscle, we noticed that there's going to be striations on the muscle. So there's going to be these dark lines and then these light lines. So the dark portions are going to be called A bands. The light portions are going to be called I bands. And in the middle of the A band, you have something called the H zone. The way to remember this is that um, the way I remember it is by thinking about how the second letter in dark is A, so A band, and how the second letter in light is I, so I band. That's how I remember it. So let's take a look over here. So we talked about here's a myofibril. Um, here's a sarcomere 
from one Z line to another. We have one sarcomere. Now, <clears throat> this A band here, this is the area that appears dark under the microscope. It's going to appear like dark lines. These are going to appear dark. So the reason why they appear dark is because there's going to be these overlapping of proteins here. So this portion from here to here, where you see these overlapping of these um, red lines and these blue lines, this is called the A band. And this is what appears dark under the microscope. Now here, where you don't see the overlapping of the proteins or filaments, this is called the I band. And this is what appears light under the microscope. And again, at the very center of the A band, this dark portion here, you have something called the H zone. And we'll talk about what the H zone is in just a little bit. Um, another organelle that you're going to find in skeletal muscle fibers that is unique is the smooth ER. This you know, other cells in your body have a smooth ER, but this specialized smooth ER is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what you'll notice that is really important about this is that it stores calcium ions and it releases them when the cell needs to contract. So calcium ions are absolutely necessary for contraction to happen. Um, and these calcium ions are going to be stored and released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What you'll notice about these sarcoplasmic reticulums is that they're also, um, they're kind of like long. They run longitudinally with the myofibril. So here are myofibrils here. And this blue structure that's covering it at running along the length of the myofibril is a sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the specialized smooth ER. T tubules are another organ that are unique to skeletal muscle cells um, or muscles. Um, T tubules are going to be found at each A band and I band junction. They're going to be these elongated tubes. They're going to increase the surface area of the muscle fiber, but they're also important for allowing these action potentials to travel along the length of the muscle fiber, or in other words, for the electrical signals to travel along the length of the muscle fiber. So on this diagram here, these yellow structures that you see, these are going to be the T-tubules. Now, when we take a look at this um, myofibril here, you know, we kind of talked about this portion right here where you have this, these overlapping of filaments. This is called the A-band. Um, where the filaments are not overlapping. This is called the I band. So let's talk about what these filaments are that you find in the myofibrils. There are mainly two types of contractile filament um, you're going to find in the myofibrils. They're called thick filaments and thin filaments. And we will talk about what each one is composed of. So let's take a look at this myofibril here. Um, the red lines that you see here that are thicker, these are called the thick filaments. And the blue lines that you see here that are thin, these are called thin filaments. And the movement of these filaments against one another is what allows contraction to happen. So the thick filaments right here, if we take them, we blow it up, and we want to see what they're made of, they're going to be made out of this molecule here called the myosin. A myosin molecule is going to have a head and a tail. Here is the tail, and here is the head. What you'll find with these molecules is that you'll you're going to have two of them, two molecules wrapped around each other, and you'll we will talk about why this is important. Um, and then here's the tail, and here are the two heads over here. 
And these two heads are like attachment sites for, for um, contraction, but also for, you know, um, extension. So they kind of allow this contraction of muscle to happen. So again, the thick filaments in your muscles are going to be made out of this molecule here called the myosin. This is just another diagram. You can see the myosin tail here, and here are the myosin heads, which are going to be binding sites. They're going to bind to things. Remember how we talked about the thick filaments and thin filaments? Well, here are the thick filaments, the red ones, and the blue ones here are going to be the thin filaments. And if we take this thick filament here and we pull out one of the molecules, you'll see something like this. Um, here is the myosin molecule with a tail and the head, and they're all going to be bundled up together to form these thick filaments. So if you take a look at this thick filament over here, you'll see that it's going to be made out of many, many myosin molecules. What you'll notice about these thick filaments is that the heads are going to be towards the sides, and in the middle, there's going to be no head. So this is just like the tails here and the heads are going to be right here to the sides. So this is what the thick filament is made out of. It's made out of bundles of myosin that are arranged in this particular way. Now, again, in the center of the sarcomere, the thick filaments are going to lack a myosin head. So myosin heads are going to be to the sides. And in the middle, where there is no head, you have something called the H zone. And they create these dark lines called M lines. So this is the H zone. You don't, there's myosin here, of course, but there's no myosin heads here in the middle. This is just another diagram, same thing. Um, the blue here, all of the blue, this, these are the thick filaments. And if you take this, you blow it up, it looks like this. You could see the heads here on the side, the myosin heads on the side. And in the middle, there's going to be no heads. It's just made out of tails. So those were the thick filaments. Now. There's also, the myofibril is also going to have something called thin filaments. And um, there's three components to thin filaments. The main protein that makes up these thin filaments is called actin. Um, and then there's also going to be something else called tropomyosin. And then another protein called troponin. So let's take a look at what the thin filament looks like. If we um take it and blow it up it's going to look something like this these pearl like molecules here or proteins these are called actin what you'll notice about actin here is that it's not perfectly like round it's more of kidney shape you'll notice that it has this dark spot here this is a binding site so Thin filaments are mainly made out of actin. Now there's another um, structure here that you find on thin filaments, and that's, that's called tropomyosin. It's sort of like this rope, as you can see in the purple here. This is the tropomyosin. So it's going to attach here to the actin, and what it's doing is that when your muscle is in a relaxed state, when it is um, in a relaxed state, it's going to cover these binding sites on actin. So as you can see here, these holes on actin are covered by the tropomyosin. And another protein that you're going to find here is called the troponin complex. And as you can see with the troponin complex, it has three structures, like one, two, three. And that's because it really has three binding sites. So these are the three parts to thin filaments. Okay, same thing that I just said. Thin filaments are mainly made out of proteins called actin, which are those pearl-shaped proteins. 
Um, they're sort of kidney shaped. They have an act. They have a binding site on them. But depending on what's going on in the muscle, uh, the binding site may be covered or it may be exposed. So when a muscular contraction happens, the myosin heads are going to uh, attach to those binding sites that we just talked about. So let's take a look at this. This is what the thin filament is going to look like when the muscle is relaxed and there is no need for the muscle to contract. Um, but if we take a look at troponin here, troponin is going to be that structure that has three units on it. So here's troponin. It's going to have one subunit that binds to actin, one subunit that binds to tropomyosin, one subunit that binds to calcium. So let's go back. Here are the three subunits. One of these units is going to be bound to this actin molecules. One of these subunits is going to be bound to tr um, tropomyosin. And another one of these subunits is going to bind to calcium. It may not be bound to cal calcium all the time, but it is a binding site for calcium. So when the muscle is in a relaxed state, the thin filaments look like this. You could see that there is nothing, no calcium bound to the troponin. Your troponin, this is supposed to represent troponin. And the tropomyosin is covering the binding sites on actin in a relaxed state. However, when calcium binds to troponin, look what happens. The, when bi calcium binds to troponin, tropomyosin this rope-like structure is going to move and it is going to expose these binding sites on actin so they were covered here but now that calcium is bound these um, binding sites are exposed on actin this is necessary for muscular contraction to happen So when calcium binds, the muscle is able to contract. So I'm going to talk about um, how the head of um, these myosin molecules binds to actin. I'll show you a diagram in just a second. So this is in a relaxed state. This is in a contracted state. In a relaxed state where calcium is not bound to troponin, you could see here the muscle is relaxed here. Um, when calcium binds, plus ATP, by the way, so you also need energy for this to happen. When calcium binds to troponin, tropomyosin moves out of the way. And what's going to ha happen is that these myosin heads are going to bind to actin and pull. They're going to pull these, these actin filaments towards the middle. So if you take a look at these two diagrams here, what you'll notice is that the myosin didn't move, right? It's about the same length. But what happened is that these, these thin filaments here got pulled towards the middle. They got pulled towards the H zone. So now they're contracted. So this is relaxed. This is contracted. So again, uh, calcium and ATP, of course, are going to be absolutely necessary for muscular contraction to happen. So let's talk about how and where this calcium comes and how the signal for a muscular contraction comes. So muscle contraction begins with a type of neuron called motor neuron. Um, both neurons and muscle cells are excitable which means that they respond to changes in voltage. In other words, um, charged particles can uh, move across the membranes of these cells and generate those uh, electrical signals that I talked about earlier. So one of the main functions of neurons is to communicate by these electrical uh, signals, by these electrical impulses. So, What's going to happen is that it is going to begin with an action potential coming from a neuron. 
In other words, an electrical signal coming from a motor neuron. So your nervous system is going to communicate with muscles in your body. And the thing about these electrical impulses is that they cannot jump from one cell to another. So electricity can jump between cells in your body. So what's going to happen is that when these electrical impulses travel down a cell or a neuron, they're going to send out signals to the nearby cells to also generate an action potential by these things called neurotransmitters. These are chemical messengers. So this is how a neuron would communicate with your skeletal muscle fibers by these chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters have the ability to generate an action potential. This is an example of what a motor neuron would look like. So this is like the body, this is the nucleus, this is the axon. Um, an action potential would probably get generated somewhere here if it is large enough. Um, or I should say, if the impulse is large enough, an action potential will be generated. It will travel down this axon, go all the way down to these terminal parts of the axon, and release neurotransmitters that can bind to nearby muscles. So, um, so these are the terminals of a motor neuron, as you can see here, right here. It looks like they're touching the skeletal muscle fibers, but they're really not. They come really, really close, but they don't touch. So if we take this right here, for example, and we blow it up, it looks something like this. Here is the terminal of that neuron, and this is a the cytoplasm of a skeletal muscle fiber called uh, the sarcolemma right here. So as you can see, they're not touching and they form something here called the synaptic cleft. So when the action potential travels down this neuron, it cannot jump to the cell over here. So it's going to release these chemicals that are going to be able to communicate with this muscle over here. These are called um, synaptic vesicles. So it's going to generate these bubbles here. These are called vesicles. And it's going to have these molecules here called ACH or acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is going to come out here, diffuse into this cleft, and it's going to bind to these receptors here on the skeletal muscle um, membrane. So when this happens, what will happen is that some gated channels, chemically gated channels on the skeletal muscle fiber are going to open. And what's going to rush in is, cal is um, excuse me, sodium is going to rush in. So, again, I'm just going to repeat this one more time. Action potential will travel down the neuron. Get to, this, get to this terminal portion, the action potential cannot jump, so it's going to form these vesicles here with neurotransmitters, and specifically this neurotransmitter is called the acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is going to diffuse into this cleft over here, and then acetylcholine is going to bind to these receptors on skeletal muscle fibers, and it is going to open up these channels these sodium gated channels. And what's going to happen is that sodium is going to rush in. For some reason, my tablet is kind of slow. So sodium is going to rush in. And Potassium is actually going to leave, but sodium rushes in much faster than potassium leaves. So this actually can generate something called an action potential. I will talk about action potentials in detail, but for now you can think about them like as these electrical signals.
So once action potential is generated, it is going to travel down this skeletal muscle fiber through these T tubules that we talked about. Because remember, skeletal muscle fibers are long, so they're gonna it's gonna travel down the entire length of the skeletal muscle fiber. And this action potential here is also gonna um, cause calcium ions to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, we need calcium for muscle contraction to happen. So when calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it can bind to that structure we talked about called troponin. Troponin will change shape and it will cause tropomyosin, those rope shaped structures to expose the binding sites on actin. So here, here's uh, when your muscle is relaxed, there's no calcium bound here to troponin, tropomyosin, is covering these binding sites but now that calcium was released because of an action potential calcium is going to bind to troponin complex and then the the binding sites on actin are going to be exposed now what's going to happen is that myosin heads are going to attach right here to these actin um, active sites, these binding sites on actin. So here, remember this was a thick filament, here's myosin, here's myosin head, it's going to bind to actin now, and it's gonna form this cross bridge. Now if you pay attention to this um, myosin head here, um, you'll notice that it is bound to myosin now, so it's formed this cross bridge. But what another molecule that's attached to it is an ADP molecule and phosphate. So we kind of talked about, I don't remember if we talked about this or not, but ATP is the primary energy source in your body. So remember we had ATP, which was made out of adenine and three phosphates. This is called adenosine triphosphate. Now, if we break one of these, you're going to end up with ADP, aden um, adenosine diphosphate. So when ATP is hydrolyzed, it forms ADP and a phosphate molecule right here. So this is what's over here. Now, what's gonna happen next is that this power stroke is going to happen. So ADP and the phosphate that were attached to this myosin head are going to be released and the myosin head is going to pivot and bend. So this is what's gonna cause contraction to happen. These um, thin filaments here, these actin molecules are going to be pulled towards the H zone. And so this is going to allow contraction to happen. And this is the low energy state of this molecule. So um, for the myosin head to become released, so remember it is bound to actin right now, for the myosin head to release, what will happen, what will need to happen is for an ATP molecule to come in and attach to the myosin head. Once an ATP molecule is attached to the head, it can let go of actin. So the cross bridge here is going to break. And then the, the uh, myosin will go back to its high energy state. Remember, ATP can become hydrolyzed to be ADP and phosphate. So it's going to release it, and this is what um, allows that extension to happen. So this is become this becomes the relaxed form of the muscle. So this is the contraction. This is what needs to happen for contraction to happen. And once ATP binds to the myosin head again, um, it can let go of 
um, actin and it will become relaxed again. So here are the steps again, and I know it is complicated, so you might want to watch this more than once. Um, it just takes a little bit of memorization, especially of all the steps that are involved. And this diagram shows you like the big picture, how it all begins with a um, motor neuron releasing acetylcholine, um, causing an action potential in the cell an action potential causing calcium to be released and the calcium allowing this contraction to happen. And this is the end of the muscular system. Next, we will start the nervous system and then we'll also talk about the brain and some of the cranial nerves.